Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12, uh, Machine Learning from Data, and this is video 1. In today's lecture, uh, we will talk about regularization, and this is the first weapon, I would say, to combat overfitting. So we saw overfitting is an issue in the previous lecture, and today we are going to deal with it using some, something that's known as regularization. So that's the focus of today's lecture. We'll understand how to constrain a model, a more complex model, and we'll talk more about augmented error and error in general. Okay, so let's begin. Overfitting, this is from the previous lecture. This is what we saw, right? And fitting more than that is warranted is what overfitting is. That's how it is defined. As you can see, this data had a little bit of noise and the target fun function was relatively simpler, but we fitted a very complex model and basically it went astray, I would say, with just like five data points because there was noise in the data. And then that's what noise uh, ca causes, essentially. Okay, so because we wanted to model noise, which we cannot, and so that's what this results in. And we really overfitted like each and every point in the data, and you can see that this is like really bad for generalization. This is bad overall in the process of picking the hypotheses and so on. In addition to this, we saw two types of noises, right? two sources of noise, in fact, I would say, in our, in our data. So the first one was stochastic, and then the second one was deterministic. Stochastic was as a result of the data itself, so all the measurement error uh, is stochastic uh, error, right? And the analogy was drawn, for example, here is my uh, target, and this is the data that I have, which has like a lot of uh, extra things in there, but like as a human, I can extract the pattern that's there and say, okay, this is an elephant, right? I can ignore the noise and the complications, but then the computer won't. And if if we have this like similar type of data again and again provided to my algorithm or my computer program or whatever, it will not, for example, ignore this dot here or this this one here. And so we need to help the computer understand that this is uh, noise. This is not what is important to my final out output or outcome, rather. And then we looked at the deterministic noise where the target function was uh, somewhat complex. So this, is, this was my target function. And what I come up with my hypo hypotheses from my hypothesis set uh, was like this was my best uh, uh, like what I could come up with from my hypothesis set. So basically the an analogy was like if we have a picture for a two-year-old in their book uh, and, and, and we give them this picture which is la like a highly simplified version of the actual elephant and we just like get rid of those intricacies which are not really required because I can give them the important attributes like for example the weight of the elephant, how like the structure overall is, the legs and the trunk and everything they would be able to figure out that this is an elephant. And so we don't want to give them that extra information here. So that was a simpler hypothesis for a more complex target function. But yeah, the, there is some like the, there are some differences that get introduced and this is nothing but the deterministic noise. So these are the two parts. And so why is this discussion so important now? Because as we said, the computer needs some help like understanding that there is noise and then the noise will hurt the learning process. And so one way could be to kind of come up with features that extract most of the important information, like get rid of a situation like this, right? These extra points, right? That could be one. The other one, which is like a more no, well-known and well-implemented solution is something that's known as regularization, right? So that's what we are focusing on today, how to, to deal with overfitting, and how to deal with all these issues using regularization. Okay, so having said that, let's move on to the definition of what regularization is. Uh, in simpler terms, overfitting, if overfitting is a disease, so if overfitting is a disease, okay, uh, the cure for that uh, tendency, like specifically to fit noise, Right? So that the, the cure for that is regularization. So regularization basically constrains my learning algorithm to improve my out of sample error, which is nothing but funny E out. Uh, and as I said, it works by constraining the model, right? So we don't um, let the model go astray because we know that the model can go astray due to a lot of reasons that we discussed in the previous lecture. And so we don't want the model to, to go astray because of uh, bad generalization because of a lot of other issues. And so we, we constrain it. Now, if we constrain it, obviously we are putting some restriction on the model. And 
uh, like we are taking this medicine to cure uh, this disease of overfitting so that medicine has some side effects and as long as these side effects are uh, not overweighing the advantages of taking the medicine i would say we'll take it right and so that the, the a similar logic or a similar analogy applies here like uh, of course there are side effects but we'll we'll weigh in the side effects and uh, the advantages of taking the medicine uh, if the side effects are, are high right so then if basically what we are saying in terms of the learning uh, process is that if we cannot fit noise maybe in some situations we cannot fit the actual signal right we cannot fit the actual uh, data that we uh, need to to actually fit right so we cannot really take care of the actual um, input signal that could be one of the issues if we are really taking regularization um, into the model and, and and not taking care of certain things so we'll we'll look at like both sides like the cure versus side effects and see how we how that comes into play so let's actually begin uh, with constraining the model okay so this is like one of the earlier examples from one of the earlier lectures we have this hypothesis set right and uh, you remember one of the hypotheses set was like the equation of a line essentially ax plus b and this like blue thing was my f my target function so here like we have this hypothesis set we can fit a line with any slope or any intercept because i can like have these a's and b's vary as much as i would like based on whatever data points i have right and so it goes in all directions uh, as we saw earlier and so we really like it, it goes wild it goes astray here in this situation right it really goes goes wild and so we really want it to be more constrained because we have seen the issues with the like the, there is a lot of variability and so the variance goes high and so the the link between e in and e in and e out uh, breaks and so on right so there is a lot of variance and so we really want it to be constrained so uh somehow if we can understand that we can go i mean i can use this hypothesis set this h of x but still like constrain the values that these a and b can take let's say right i'm just like considering maybe that's like one solution of uh reducing the the variability in this right so we can do that like this like we can see as like on the right hand side if we can constrain the weights to be smaller which essentially means i can like constrain the values of a and b within a certain range i can really reduce this wildness or this variability in this and this is essentially what regularization is now in terms of the overall error right uh which of the the two models do you think is going to perform better well i can tell that this the right uh, hand side one does better and you can see that here why Uh, so this was the original model and we are calling it no regularization model and this is the actual um regularized regularized model like like with regularization so what happens here as you can see here the 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 average fit g bar of x uh it has this like the bias is low right because i am allowing it it to go as much as it can and then like come as close to the target function as possible so the bias is low but the variance is huge and we could tell like just by looking at this one as well so the variance is huge and i mean variance i would say is has, has gone out of control right it's it's really bad here in this case now in this case like because i constrained my model so i have to pay the price and that's my side effect so i'm paying the price by introducing a little bit more bias i'm paying the price by a small increase in bias but look at the gain that i get so this is my treatment so the medicine is like really effective in bringing this overall the sum of the bias and the variance down which is like my effective error essentially so of course i bargain like i mean i i lost a little bit here i would say in terms of the bias so that was the side effect but then of course my my treatment outweighed the effects of my my side effect and so i will take this medicine and that's what this is suggesting the right side the bias goes up a little bit that's a side effect but you can see the variance has gone down by a huge value also this was like a small like pointing to one of the easier or very simpler i would say hypotheses that we had remember the const the constant model in our example even like when this entire uh, thing was compared with that constant model we found that even that had a bias of 0.5 and a variance of 0.25 
that was a very simple model basically telling us that our regularized model beats that as well so we are utilizing the good thing here is we are utilizing or we are able to utilize the extra flexibility of my um, ax plus b which had two parameters versus the one that we had uh, i don't remember correctly but just like this small uh, very simpler model so this was like this had less flexibility but we chose it in many situations because it was giving us a better uh, variance value now you can see with the added regularization i can achieve that even with a more complex model so that is the fundamental idea that we are going to discuss today uh, so let us move on with the mathematics behind regularization okay so even before jumping into any mathematics what we are trying to do is we are trying to constrain our model let me write down the important points that we are trying to do so we are trying to constrain or i would say just like constrain the model or introduce constraints it would have been the same thing but i'm just like writing constrain the model and what we'll do is we'll begin looking at the linear models that's the most concrete case so that's why i'm focusing on linear models and then of course this entire discussion applies to the general scenario of other models as well but then this is the most basic model makes our discussion uh, more relevant and so what we'll do is once we are looking at the concrete case of linear models we'll link the constraint to two things which is okay so there will be a link to constraints as you can tell and these constraints would be of two type a hard order constraint and a soft order constraint and we'll see the difference between both of them and then finally we'll try to implement it in linear regression essentially okay so a quick reminder of the vc theory so the vc inequality looked something like this uh, e out of g is linked to e in of g plus the error bar which was a function of my hypothesis set so basically how we interpreted it earlier was that if i'm fitting with a simpler h right so if i'm fitting with a simple h simple hypothesis that was better because it kept this link tighter and of course the explanation uh, comes from the vc theory itself now let's take it a step further now if, what happens if we replace this error bar the dependence of this error bar on my entire hypothesis set and in fact say that this is like rather make it dependent on one of the hypotheses g well so the question arises will it work and can be implemented and if yes then how will be implemented how will we do that so let us work with a regression because it's easier to work with and then make general comments about uh, modeling this this uh, way of like getting hypotheses set to like come down to a more simpler version of that hypothesis set in general right so let's let's begin uh, working with linear regression so let me just like write it down we have like in in any linear uh, regression model we have this data so let's say this is the data that i have x1 y1 x2 y2 this is a quick like reminder although we've seen that before but that's fine and let us assume for this linear model i'm trying to uh transform this to some other z space right and so let's say this is the transformation and then if that's the case this is what we get and remember the target vector which is like my y's does not change right so z to y2 basically i'm going still going to get the same answer whether i'm in this space or that space right it does not matter so basically all my x's like my data matrix is my x and my target vector is my y in my original space but in my transformed space so my transformed data matrix is z and the target vector still remains the same for that and that is going to be my y now in linear regression what we are trying to do is we are trying to find this we are trying to find this th these weights w tilde in my z space right so i'm trying to find this in my z space this new transformed space 
And the way I'm trying to find that is by minimizing the squared error between the uh, prediction vector and the target vector, right? So in like uh, more linear algebra uh, representation, I would write it that I'm trying to minimize this, this term. So I'm trying to minimize essentially this v tilde minus y transpose times z w tilde minus y. So basically the norm of the difference between the prediction vector and the target vector. So you're trying to minimize this. Now, if my z was invertible, if my z was uh, invertible, then uh, I could really get like solve this by like multiplying this. Remember this equation almost equal to y. So multiply this equation both sides by uh, the inverse, z inverse, and then, and then just like get the result. But that is generally not the case. So for a more generic case, what we did was we said, and like mostly because you have like more data than dimensions, it's not a square matrix. So instead we used another representation of this and we said, let's use the pseudo inverse of that to get the W tilde as. And so that's that still remains in the Z space. So I'll get the in, like the pseudo inverse instead of the inverse. And this is how I get the result. When, and when Z is invertible, then this, was given by, and this is like a repeat of what we saw in the pseudo inverse algorithm, but just so that we remember this. Okay, so here is how we were solving for Ws and here is how we were getting uh, the weights in the, the transform space. Now, I'm going to like, we are going to work a lot with polynomials because we are trying to understand the difference between complex models and easier models. And so what I'm going to introduce is a different kind of polynomial transforms. And because the textbook uses them, and so I'm using this different polynomials. These are known as Legendre's polynomials. And they, this is the spelling, Legendre's polynomials. And why are we doing that? Right? So again, these are analogous to the original uh, polynomial transforms that we've looked at until now. But the only thing is we are using these because these have nice mathematical properties. And we'll see what are these like, what ni nice mathematical properties. Let's look at them. Again, the, the transform is similar to what we did with the uh, other transforms, except that like this is one and this L1 of X, L2 of X and so on up to LQ of X, where this like one, two and Q are the order of the Legendre's polynomial. And this is exactly like, this one is exactly like a first order polynomial. And so this one is like a qth order polynomial, similar to that. And as I said, that these have like nice mathematical properties, so that's why we are using them. And what are those nice mathematical properties? First of all, they're easier to uh, visualize. For example, in a regular polynomial, like the graph of an x cube versus x5 will be like very close to one another. And so, almost like similar with, with the Legendre's polynomial, you can see the difference. So there's like, there is a general equation to generating each of these, which we are not looking at right now. But just imagine that this like entire discussion is also applicable, technically speaking, to like normal polynomials as well. But we are taking this for our discussion so that we can visualize certain things and, and make our, our discussion more concrete in terms of the math that comes in and everything. So let me show you like what, what exactly I'm talking about. And of course, the details are in the textbook. So just like focus on these pictures down here. So this is like the first order Legendre's polynomial, second order, third order, fourth, fourth order, and fifth order, right? As you can see, as we are increasing the degree, these are getting really more complex. The picture itself is, is, is really getting complex. We are talking about constraining complex models, right? And so that is why these are helpful in our discussion. Again, I'm repeating all polynomial transfor or transforms can will give us eventually these patterns or these functions, which are implementable by linear combinations and my linear model. All of that is, is applicable. But just for the ease of understanding things, just for the ease of making things mathematically convenient, we are using this. Another important property of these, and as you can see, like this is the Legendre polynomial transform. Um, another important property is that they are orthogonal to one another. And the notion of that is just, just try to understand the notion of that, which is like the notion of independence, right? So that helps us in controlling the complexity of the function because I can constrain one of them and keep the other order as it is. 
that's all. So it allows us to treat the weights independently. So that's another nice property of these is that they are orthogonal. So that really helps us. And so that's why we're using it. So this is the Legendre's polynomial and you can see the transform. And this is like our standard polynomial that we've worked with. So having said that, let's like use this, this as our Z from now on for this discussion at least. Okay, so having said that, let's move on. Let's look at, look at two hypothesis sets. So I'm introducing two hypothesis sets. And the first one is H2. And what is, what is this? This is like a second order uh, polynomial. So basically my hypothesis set is H of X such that my H of X is going to be the weight W0 plus W1 L1 X. So I'm like second order Legendre's polynomial, polynomial transform essentially. And then uh, the second weight in L2 of X such that this W is in the in this space. Okay, that's great. The second hypothesis set is again H of X such that H of X is W0 plus W1 L1 X plus W2 L2 X, everything in terms of the Legendre's polynomial now, and so on W10 L10 X where my W's will be in this 11th order space, right? Okay, all of that is fine. So in general, what I'm saying is that any H of Q is the sum Q from zero up to whatever that is, the weights and L Q of X. Right, so in general, this is like any, oops, this shouldn't be two, this should be 10. Okay, so if we're looking at H2 and H10, we are focusing on that. We can say that my H2 is, is like really simple, right? So it is, is most likely a subset of my more complex H10, right? H2 is a simpler hypothesis set and H10 is a more complex hypothesis set. And I can say that H2 forms like a subset of, of all the, the values of H10. Now also like one important thing, if we can somehow say that the E in of H2 is almost equal to the E in that I get with H10 for any problem that I'm looking at, if, I, if I'm able to achieve that, then I'm better off choosing my H2, right? It's always a better option to just like, if I'm not like making a lot of gain in getting a more like using a more complex model, I'm better off choosing my simple one because it has like a tighter link to E out via the VC theory, right? So yeah, all of that is good. So effectively, if I can constrain my more complex model, if I can do something to it, right? and still keep like utilize its flexibility and then maybe I can make it fit better and then I'll be better off if I can like use this like because this is a this is just a subset of, of, of this larger uh, more complex model and so if I can constrain it somehow if I can make it simpler under certain situations then I'm better off right this is what this this implies essentially so that's the key takeaway here now let's try doing that okay so let me try to write H2 in another way. So H2 can be also written as the set H of X such that H of X is W0 plus W1 L1 X, W2 L2 X plus and so on, W10 L10 X where W is in this space. Okay, so this is like, wait, this is not correct, right? This is like uh, H2 doesn't have all these uh, values. We don't need that. Well, I can still write H2 like as a, as a more general case of H10 such that I can apply this constraint. I can apply the constraint that all the weights starting from W3 to W4 and so on will be equal and they will all be equal to zero. Right, so if I add this constraint to my definition of my hypothesis set, I can achieve this simpler hypothesis from my more complex one. So basically what I'm doing is this is a hard order constraint. This is a hard order constraint. Why is this a hard order constraint? Because I'm explicitly setting the values of certain parameters or these weights to be zero. 
So why is it better to, to do that? It's better because my hypothesis, my simpler hypothesis, H2 is better than H10 when, like under certain cases, like when there is noise or when, when N is small and, 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 and so on. So maybe I'm better off um, making these smaller or making them equal to zero. Okay, so this is like one way of, of getting a simpler model from a more complex one because we saw that we were better off using a more simpler one. Fine. Now let us introduce another uh, constraint which is known as the soft order constraint. So let's look at that. That's the soft order constraint. Okay. What's that? Now, what if I give you this exact same h sub 2, oh, sorry, h of 2, yeah, and then say that you can make these w's small, you can make them, like, let them have any value, but it should not exceed a certain budget, which means it should not exceed a certain um, preset parameters, which is known as a budget, and it's denoted by c. So instead of, like, explicitly setting each of the weights to zero, let's choose a budget such that we don't want our some of these weights to exceed this budget. So every time you add a weight to one of the order uh, of this, this polynomial, you'll pay a price. So basically you will have something that's known as H C. H sub C is like this. The And again, this is like a 10th order polynomial, but it's constrained by a soft order constraint. So that's why I'm calling it H C and H of X. Again, it's going to be similar to that w1, l1, x, plus so on, l10. And again, it's in this space, right? But I have this added constraint such that, like, I'm saying for, for this one, because this is like a 10th order, so q is 0 to 10, and q squared should not exceed my budget, that's c. This is called a soft order constraint because it only encourages each weight to be smaller without changing the order of the polynomial. Because I would have changed the order of the polynomial in this case, the hard order constraint, because I just don't have those terms. So here I'm not explicitly getting rid of those terms, but rather I'm keeping them, but I'm allowing them to go only a certain level and not go beyond that. So I'm not like changing the order of the polynomial. I'm not setting, I'm, I'm setting definitely some of the weights to be zero, but not all. So basically, again, this h sub c is going to be a subset of h10. And the best it could, could go is like h10. So this is like a constrained version of h10. So it has a soft order constraint. In other words, if you think about this budget, now with this budget c, we can decide how strong a constraint we want. For example, if I let c go to infinity, what do you think happens? Basically, it has recovered my h10. Right? It has like totally recovered. So I'm, I'm basically moving in this space, H10 up to H2. And this is where I'm exploring. This is my C and I can explore what is best for my problem, for my model. Right, I'm exploring this region. So in summary, we have linked like models with constraints to get a better out of sample error. Why? Because you can get a better generalization provided we are doing okay with the in sample error as well. Right, if we got a good in sample error and then we have this constrained uh, sort of model, you know that it, it is going to generalize be better because in some, some ways we are better off using simple models and why to get rid of like the flexibility of the more complex models. So all of that is good. Now we have created that link, as I said, with constrained models and the out of sample error, all of that is good. Now, how do we actually implement this in like, uh, actual real models. So that's what we're going to see in the next video. How do we actually, I mean, we understand that this is a good thing, but how do we like implement it?